I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. Crockmill as our grand round speaker today. Um, Dr. Crockmill um, is a graduate of VCU School of Medicine and did her medicine residency in pulmonary critical care fellowship at University of Maryland and then an uh, um, interventional pulmonary fellowship at uh, Emory and joined us uh, a couple of years ago now and has been a key player in our, uh, the growth of our interventional pulmonary program, joined Dr. Anderson and they're both doing great work. So we're so pleased that Rebecca is gonna give us the latest information on some very interesting new technology to detect uh, and diagnose peripheral nodules. So Dr. Crockmill, thank you. We are gonna talk about uh, diagnosis of the peripheral lung nodule. Um, I have no disclosures regarding this. The objectives today are to do an overview of both the lung cancer screening trials as well as the um, uh, incidentally detected lung nodule. We'll talk about risk calculators and surveillance options for both the incidentally detected as well as lung cancer screening associated nodules. And then we'll talk about non-invasive as well as invasive biopsy options for these. But first we should start with a case. So we have a, um, sorry, I'm minimize this, hopefully you can see that. Um, we have a 72 year old female. She has an extensive smoking history uh, and she had a low dose screening CT that was done in 2018 and detected a six centimeter, sorry, 0. 0.6 centimeter solid speculated right upper lobe nodule that on follow up imaging about a year later showed growth for which she obtained a PET scan. And I'm gonna show you the imaging here, but her PFTs are adequate with just some moderate uh, COPD. So the imaging is this right upper lobe speculated nodule that I've highlighted with the arrow sign with some associated mild uh, pet avidity. So throughout the course of the talk, we're gonna review the options of what we would do next with this nodule and um, what the um, uh, data behind it is. So lung nodules are quite common. There's an incidence of about 1.6 million uh, detected every year in the US. In fact, if you had a healthy cohort of volunteers, you would have anywhere from 25 to 50% of those uh, volunteers with a detectable lung nodule. And we'll talk about the screening population and the frequency of that as well. But not all lung nodules are malignant. Um, in fact, a lot of them are benign. And some of the giveaways to this are some of the calcification patterns of the nodules themselves. So in the top four here, you can see a diffuse, a central, a popcorn, and a laminated calcification all of which are benign uh, findings. And the malignant findings, if you were looking just at calcification, would be the stippled pattern, as well as an eccentric calcification. That being said, there are, of course, many other characteristics that would define a malignant nodule from a benign. Um, of course, the presence of speculations, irregular contour, and larger size would all bow towards a malignant nodule, and benign being smaller size, smooth, round, and well circumscribed as well. So let's chat about the incidentally detected lung nodule. Um, besides from obtaining prior imaging to, to see if the nodule was present before, you do want to uh, try to predict the likelihood of the nodule being malignant. And this is based off of um, two prior uh, studies that were looking at modeling to try to determine the uh, characteristics of the nodules that would make them seem like they'd be malignant. So two that I wanna highlight here are the Mayo model and the VA model. The Mayo model is a retrospective study. It was of 419 patients at the Mayo Clinic, and this was based off of chest X-ray. And the chest X-ray itself, they were detecting nodules that were less than three centimeters being the threshold for uh, a lung nodule versus a lung mass. They had no prior history of lung cancer. And what they found is that um, older age, previous or current smoking history, history of extra thoracic malignancy recently within the past five years, speculations, larger size, upper lobe location, were all independent factors for malignancy. We still use a lot of these today in our modeling to um, determine the likelihood of an incidentally lung uh, nodule being malignant. The VA model was quite similar. It was notably as expected, um, predominantly men in the study itself. They were a little bit older with a mean age of 65, a little bit of a larger nodule as well. And again, this is all based off of chest x-rays, so not CTs, but chest x-rays. And they found similar findings in that current or former smokers, older age, size of the nodule, and then time since smoking cessation were all independent, independent predictors of a lung nodule that was incidentally found being malignant. So we've got these models that we can use, but what about clinician judgment? 
And surprisingly, or not surprisingly, clinician judgment is actually quite good. So a study looking at academic clinicians at a national conference, and these were pulmonologists, they were fellows, and they were primary care physicians. They were assigned vignettes. There were 176 different clinical vignettes that looked at nodules ranging from seven to 30 millimeters in size, and they were given CT images. And each participant was given five vignettes, um, and then uh, nearly half of them had nodules on them. So they were then asked to grade those to see if they were malignant or not. And surprisingly or not, um, there actually was no difference between accuracy of the clinicians and those with the previous models that I just mentioned. So physician acumen to diagnose or suspect a lung nodule as being malignant is quite good. That being said, we also sometimes may overestimate the malignancy prediction, and in the study that was seen. Um, and surprisingly or not, there was no difference in predictive accuracy of the nodules between um, those that are still in training and then those that are in practice. So taking this into account, there are societal recommendations for nodules and for management of the incidentally detected lung nodule. Um, the first we'll talk about here is the American College of Chest Physicians. And they start to stratify the risk of a nodule being malignant based off of similar things that we were just talking about. So less than 5% risk of malignancy in the younger with less smoking history, smaller size, regular margins, and a non-upper lobe location. And those with high risk, uh, greater 60, than 65% risk of this nodule being malignant, were older age, they have a heavy smoking history, larger size, irregular margins, upper lobe location, and spiculated. And we take this into account when we go through some of the charts and the diagrams of what the workup for these nodules should be. So the first one here is if we have a solid indeterminate nodule picked up incidentally and a size of eight to 30 millimeters. So the ACCP would tell you to first assess for surgical risk. If there are high surgical risk, you're not even gonna consider surgery, you're gonna proceed down a pathway of either CT surveillance or a non-surgical biopsy. If they are a surgical candidate, then um, you are going to proceed down the pathway I have highlighted here um, in green. And that is when you start to risk stratify. So we talk about what I was just saying of the very low risk patient with findings of the nodule not being concerning for malignancy, they may be appropriate for CT surveillance. If they're high risk, then you may proceed directly to surgery if there's no evidence of uh, meta uh, metastatic disease. And this is where the PET scan may play a role in this part. And that is that if we are worried about metastatic disease and we want a PET scan for preoperative planning, then this would fall into the need for the high risk nodule um, in this category. And of course, if they're not gonna be, um, if it's high risk and they're not a surgical candidate, then there are other options, which is radiotherapy and then radiofrequency ablation as well as other modalities. But what is the less clear and a little bit more murky part is those that have a low to moderate risk nodule. So they may have some findings of um, the low risk category and some findings of the high risk category. And this is where you actually are starting to um, jump to PET first. And you wanna see if there's avidity in the nodule or not. And then if there is not, you may proceed to CT surveillance or you may just proceed to a non-surgical biopsy or surgical resection. And these are the ACCP guidelines for nodules that are eight to 30 millimeters. Those that are a little bit smaller, um, so less than eight millimeters in diameter, and we'll talk about uh, different sizes based off different societal recommendations in a second, but their cutoff um, of the lung nodule is four millimeters for monitoring. So they first want you to assess the risk of lung cancer in the patient. If it's uh, low risk and the size is small, then you may not do anything. If it is uh, a larger size and they're high risk, then you're probably gonna proceed to pretty close um, CT follow-up. And then if the nodule does grow, then you can and start to proceed down a pathway um, as indicated by what we previously spoke about. So these are the ACCP guidelines for incidentally detected lung nodules. The next is the Fleischner Society. So the Fleischner Society is a radiographic society and they first came out with recommendations in 2013 that they revised in 2017. And these are regarding solid nodules um, in the left hand column here, as well as sub solid nodules on the right. So solid nodules are nodules that you detect on a CAT scan that you cannot see through them. There's no lung parenchyma that you can see through. In a ground glass 
chest nodule, um, you can see through the lung parenchyma to what's behind it. And a subsolid nodule, I'm sorry, a partly solid nodule um, is a combination of the two where you may have a solid component, but it's um, also a ground glass component as well. So a couple of things about the Fleischner guidelines here. So these only apply to patients that are older than 35, and that's because lung cancer is quite uncommon in the young population. They do not apply to anyone who's immunocompromised. That would increase the risk of a nodule being infectious. And they also don't apply to anyone that has a known primary lung cancer. So if you look at the tables here, they start to stratify based off of size as well as by morphology. And they also want you to assess the risk of the patient itself. And this risk is dependent upon um, the ACCP guidelines of uh, risk uh, calculators. So um, whether or not we think that it's low or high risk. So the Fleischer Society guidelines also use a, a thin cut CT. So these are one millimeter cuts. These are not your standard CT cuts. They're much smaller and that allows us to give a, a lot of granularity with the nodules. Um, we can detect if there's calcium or fat components. And this is really important for uh, dictating the management options of the nodule itself. So if you have a small nodule, meaning less than six millimeters, and you assess that your risk is quite low, you may not need follow-up. Alternatively, if it's a larger nodule and a high-risk patient, then you are going to start thinking about um, proceeding with uh, additional imaging, be it a PET scan or direct tissue sampling. I wanna spend a minute here on these subsolid nodules. So the ground glass and the partly solid nodules. So we know from the morphology, I'm sorry, the um, biologic um, um, activity of the nodules that some of the ground glass nodules are actually quite slow growing. So the Fleischner Society took that into account in their latest recommendations, and they actually recommend for follow-up up to five years. And that's because if you have a ground glass nodule less than five millimeters, that is usually uh, representative of a pre-invasive lung adenocarcinoma, and it may be atypical edematous hypoplasia. And for that, you would want to follow it more frequently, or sorry, for a longer period of time. If the ground glass nodule is a little bit bigger, six millimeters or more, that may be representative of adenocarcinoma in situ or min minimally invasive adenocarcinoma. And the reason to follow those is that if they do show growth, there is a 100% disease specific survival rate with this. Um, the growth rate, like I said, of these ground glass nodules is quite slow. In one study, the mean of um, duration for a solid component, meaning an invasive component to show up was three and a half years. Um, when we talk about the um, Ground glass nodules additionally, um, owing to the slow growth rate of them, they will not all become malignant. In fact, only 10% will grow over time and 1% will progress to being malignant. So we also talk about the doubling time of nodules and this is reflected in the imaging. And so a volume doubling time of cancer is usually on the order of 100 to 400 days, kind of in the center of this schematic here. If they double quite quickly, that's usually more reflective in inflammatory or infectious etiology, quite slowly as the um, other side of the spectrum is being benign. So if you do have growth over 100 to 400 days on subsequent imaging, you are a little bit more concerned that this could be malignant. And a growth of 26% uh, in diameter of a nodule is equal to doubling of the volume of the lesion, lesion, making you think again that this may be malignant. So you will see on your CT reports of incidentally detected nodules, Fleischner Society recommendations about when follow-up should be obtained or when we should go ahead and proceed with a more invasive approach. So now I wanna to toggle to the lung cancer screening nodules. Why do we care? Well, we care because lung cancer is the leading cause of death worldwide. Um, cancer death, excuse me, uh, worldwide. Um, it is, even in 2020, um, there are, um, the American Cancer Society predicts that this will hold true, that lung cancer will still be the primary cause of death um, for cancer in men and women. And in this year, over 100,000 men and women will be diagnosed with lung cancer. And owing to the asymptomatic nature of it, 
um, over 70% are usually diagnosed at an advanced age. And unfortunately, there is a five-year survival of 18% that is quite poor. That is because it's diagnosed at an advanced age. Um, if we are, or sorry, advanced stage, excuse me. If we are able to diagnose it early, the five-year survival is quite good, as high as 80%. So this is why we screen. Lung cancer screening started actually in the 70s, started with chest x-rays and sputum cytology. And this was funded by the uh, National Cancer Institute and three large academic institutions participated in this. And initially there were promising results. There were more cancers detected and there was a higher average um, survival. But when this played out, unfortunately there was no improvement in lung cancer associated mortality. And therefore we no longer screen with chest x-ray and sputum cytology. We do start screening though with CAT scan, but first I wanna mention the prostate lung colorectal ovarian cancer screening trial, PLCO for short. So this was a large randomized control trial over 150,000 participants. They were aged 55 to 74 and they were split equally into annual chest X-ray or usual care for three years. It happened at 10 sites throughout the US again, predominantly in the 90s. And what they found is that screening with an annual chest x-ray conveyed no mortality benefit for lung cancer. So we no longer screen with x-ray. However, when you look at a retrospective analysis of those that were screened with x-ray, so that was about 12,000 patients, they did come um, to a conclusion that were some variables that were independently predictive of malignancy based off of a, a screening chest x-ray. And that was a little bit surprisingly education, duration of smoking, amount of smoking, a BMI, a family history of lung cancer, whether or not there was unilateral or hyalur adenopathy indicating spread, uh, a lung mass versus a lung nodule, and then an upper lobe location. Surprisingly though, neither age nor the presence of a lung nodule itself were independent predictors of malignancy. So based off of this negative chest X-ray screening trial, we have started to screen with CAT scan. So one of the studies uh, before I move on is the Early Lung Cancer Act Action Project or LCAP. And that did use uh, chest CT and they identified non-calcified nodules about 23% of the time, of which 2.7% were malignant. And these were higher rates than screening with X-ray. So, we do um, start with the National Lung Screening Trial, the NLST, and this is the first uh, landmark trial that was looking at lung cancer screening with low-dose CT. So this was 53,000 participants. It was throughout the US as well as a couple of sites in Canada, um, the age 55 to 74 with a 30 pack year smoking history. They were current or former smokers who quit within the past 15 years. And they were randomized to either yearly low dose CT for three years or a chest X-ray. And a positive screen was with detection of a nodule that was four millimeters or lar larger. And this was based on diameter. So they were measuring the short and the long axis of the nodule rather than a volumetric analysis. And what they found is that 24% of the um, patients had a positive screen. Of this though, the vast majority were early stage. So 51% was early stage disease and only 13% was advanced stage disease. Of this, there was, based off of this, I should say, there was a 20% reduction in lung cancer mortality when using a low dose uh, CAT scan for screening. In fact, the number needed to treat um, ended up being 320 people to screen to prevent one lung cancer death. And at a follow-up extended to about 12 years, that number needed to treat is actually decreased to 303 people. All told, the all-cause mortality reduction with just screening with a yearly low-dose CT for lung cancer is 6.7%. I would be remiss though if we don't talk about the false positive rates. Of course, that does happen. You will find things that will not be cancerous, but will uh, proceed down a further evaluation. So of the um, positive screens, so of the 24% of the positive screens, 96% of those were actually false positive. The vast majority were managed with additional imaging and only 2.7% of the participants that had a positive screen underwent any sort of further invasive biopsy itself. So based off of this, 
we know that um, lung, low dose lung cancer screening um, is recommended and that there is a um, mortality benefit from it. And you can see that those at the bottom right here, those that were screened with x-ray did poorly compared to those that were screened with a low dose CT. There were a couple of subgroups that had a increased um, uh, mortality benefit from it, namely females, so women, and also African Americans as well. So those may be two populations that you do want to target for your low-dose lung cancer screening. The other large study to discuss is the Nelson trial. So the Nelson trial is the Dutch-Belgian randomized lung cancer screening trial. It was 15,000 participants in Europe and they were screened, uh, sorry, um, divvied up into having a volume-based, so instead of a diameter-based, a volume-based low-dose CT or of usual care. This took place in the early 2000s and there was a 10-year follow-up. The vast majority were men, but it was similar ages, 50, a little bit lower, to 74. They obtained a CT at baseline, one year later, three years later, and 5.5 years later. And their smoking criteria was a little bit uh, less stringent. They had a little bit of a lower smoking history. What they defined as a positive screen was that if the non-calcified nodule volume um, increased or the doubling, the volume doubling time increased. And they found that there was a 2.1% positive screen. So this is different than the NLST, which found 24% positive. It was a much lower rate of positivity here. And they found that in the screening arm, so those that got a low dose CT, that their uh, lung cancers detected on screening was actually less than 1%, but the vast majority were actually early stage disease and something that they could intervene on. Again, they did find a mortality benefit with this, um, 2.5 deaths per 100,000 in those that were screened with a low dose CT versus 3.3 deaths per 1,000 in those that were uh, obtaining the usual care. And so much so that there is a mortality benefit with a 26% reduction in lung cancer mortality and screening alone prevented 60 deaths. So when you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves over here, you can see at the bottom that lung cancer mortality in the control group certainly is higher versus that in the screening group. But the incidence of lung cancer as expected does decline in the screening group and does rise in the control group. And you can notice that about at year eight, that they start to um, uh, run in parallel, these two curves. And that's the thought is that, well, maybe the effect of lung cancer screening is only lasting about two and a half to three and a half years. And that is because the last time that they were screened was at, eight, at a year five and a half, and now we're about two and a half, three and a half years out. So the um, benefit of it may only last um, that amount of time. And that was seen in the NLST as well. So going back to our prediction models, if we take the information from the NLST, from the PLCO that I spoke about earlier with the chest X-ray as well as from the Nelson, we can start to uh, have revised modeling to estimate the likelihood of a nodule being malignant. So the PLCO model was um, re um, analyzed back in 2012 by investigators, and they looked at the similar things that we were already speaking about, age, race, ethnicity, education level, BMI, COPD, a smoking history, family history, and then the amount of smoking. And they found that when they applied this model to the NLST criteria, it, it um, um, performed quite well. And if they also used it with the um, U.S. Preventative Services Task Force criteria, which we'll talk about in a second, it performed um, quite well as well. So this is just one model that we can use to estimate the prediction of a nodule being malignant. Um, there was a recent study that looked at several of these models and they found that not one of them was superior to the other. I just want you to know about them though. So that being said, um, a, uh, one of the models that is often used um, for nodules that are detected on lung cancer screening is the Brock University model. It's easily accessed online. I've included a screenshot of it. You plug in the criteria, it gives you an estimated prediction of malignancy over a two to four year period. And this will help determine how aggressive you should or should not be with this nodule itself. This data was extrapolated from the Pan-Canadian Early Detection of Lung Cancer Study. Um, and it was, um, there is weigh-in from the PLCO adjusted model that I just mentioned. 
So you have a nodule you don't, that was seen on lung cancer screening, you don't necessarily know what to do about it. Well, fortunately, there is lung RADS criteria. So lung RADS is um, developed by the American College of Radiology Lung Imaging Reporting and Data System. It was released in 2015 and it's based off the Fleischner Society guidelines. And they'll give you a score similar to mammography or, or similar to other screening um, tools of whether or not the nodule you have uh, detected is showing any criteria that would be suspicious. So it is lung rads um, zero being an incomplete image all the way up to four. And those that are concerning would be lung rads three and lung rads four. Of course, it's based off of size. It's also based off of um, doubling time if another um, a previous scan was done. And then there's an estimated risk of malignancy associated with it. So you may just want to get a low dose CT if it's a lung rads three, but a lung rads four would need to have a more invasive approach as the likelihood of malignancy is certainly much higher. That being said, lung cancer screening and uh, has certainly made its way into not only um, societal recommendations, but also um, the U US Preventative Services Task Force and through the uh, CMS as well. So the criteria are a little bit different for each one. Uh, CMS says that we should screen those that are age 55 to 77, a little bit longer than the NLST criteria, 30 pack year smoking history who quit within the past 15 years. The US Preventative Services Task Force says we should screen, screen up to age 80, same smoking history. And then there's the NCCN. So the NCCN has two groups that they recommend for screening. One is those that meet the NLST criteria. And the second group is those that have less of a smoking history and are a bit younger, but they've got another factor. So you would start screening those that have a 20 pack year smoking history and an age only of about 50 or greater, but they have exposure to radon, uh, our occupational exposure such as arsenic, chromium, asbestos, coal smoke, silica, soot, anything that would really increase their risk of developing lung cancer. Because we've seen that um, the risk is increased um, in those populations. They also um, will include those that have a family history of lung cancer, um, a personal history of cancer itself, as well as any chronic lung disease, be it COPD or pulmonary fibrosis. So multiple screening recommendations to choose from. Implementing lung cancer screening amongst your patients can sometimes be a bit difficult. Um, there are some perceived barriers to screening, a lack of a perceived need, whether or not they would obtain psychological distress from this imaging. Is this going to cause them to be worried to have to go through repeat screening year after year? And is this really going to be a burden on them? And we did see in the NLST that that did happen a little bit. Um, some people don't want to be screened because they say the effort needed to go to a screening is too much for them to do. And some will actually be concerned about the radiation exposure related to it. So in the NLST, when you were screened over three years, your radiation amount was quite low. It was only eight. Um, these are equivalents of radiation. And we do know that when you have 50 equivalents of radiation per year, that you will get a fatal cancer in every 500 people that are exposed to that amount. But over time, the um, amount of radiation is quite low. In fact, it's five times less than a conventional chest CT when you screen with a lotus, and it is equivalent to six months of background radiation. So I think that this can be encouraging for um, your patients. Um, we also overcome some of these barriers with a multidisciplinary approach, meaning that there is a team that is behind lung cancer screening. There's usually a nurse navigator that is following, that is letting you know when you need to have another uh, CT performed. You don't have to necessarily be responsible for yourself. And there is a lot of um, buy-in as well from primary care to, to help follow this too. It's also a really great teachable moment. So if you talk about lung cancer screening and the need for it with the patient, you can also easily incorporate smoking cessation counseling into that. And in fact, they found that in the NLST, current smokers that had a nodule, not necessarily proven to be malignant, but any nodule itself, were actually significantly more likely to have stopped smoking one year later. And of course, shared decision making is key. You need to talk about what is going to happen if I find a nodule, what will I do moving forward, and know that 25 to 50% of screens will be positive, but 90% of them are benign findings. 
Lung cancer screening cost is something that is uh, concerning to some folks as well. The, it is covered by insurance. And in fact, we do see on average that a screen costs about $1,600. However, there is an increase in quality adjusted life years associated with it. And when you look at what an annual low dose screen in the NLST would be, um, it is about $81,000 per quality of life year gained. However, it is more than a colonoscopy, but quite equal to mammography. So we clearly do use mammography quite often uh, for screening and uh, incorporating a low dose CT annually um, would be um, equivocal in terms of cost and quality adjusted life years gained. So we do screen at uh, Georgetown. We have screened, I've in, uh, incorporated the data for the past two years of fiscal years data. Um, we had 330 low dose CTs. The ones that we were most concerned about were the lung rads three, the lung rads four that I mentioned. Um, 16 patients were lung rads three, two ended up being malignant. 12 were lung rads four, about 50% ended up being malignant. So all told, we have a similar detection rate as to the NLST, 2.4% cancer detection rate. Um, and the vast majority of them are benign. 60% were lung rads two or lower. It also allows you to find other things at the same time. COPD, coronary calcifications, breast nodules, and then plug patients in with you know, the appropriate care for those. So why should we care? That being said, all of the lung cancer screening, why do we care about this? And then what are we gonna do about it if we find a lung nodule? Well, we should um, care because it's probably gonna become more prevalent. The US Preventative Services Task Force guidelines for screening are probably gonna change. There was a, a recent proposal that was out to lower it to age 50 to begin with, continuing up to age 80, and lower the amount to 20 pack year smoking history, much more similar to those NCCN guidelines. The vast majority of nodules that we find are peripheral, so we need to know how to biopsy them if biopsy is needed. And we also need to know that societal guidelines recommend a diagnosis in the least invasive way possible, but also a staging if required at the same time in a single procedure. I'll cover that moving forward. So first we need to talk about what is a central nodule versus what a, is a peripheral nodule. And unfortunately there is no uniform definition of this. So a central nodule um, has been um, defined by the ACCP as being in the inner one third of the hemithorax. Um, and this is a, a diagram here of what um, that would be. Um, the NCCN says it's actually in the inner two thirds of the hemithorax and radiation oncology defines it even differently. They say it's within two centimeters of the proximal bronchial tree the heart, the great vessels, the trachea, or other mediastinal structures. And this definition was really developed because of SBRT, so stereotactic body radiotherapy, and the need to identify what is central versus peripheral. Um, we do know that our scopes, which you can see here are varying sizes, ranging from anywhere from four millimeters to up to eight plus millimeters, will reach a central nodule, but they will not clearly reach out to the periphery here. So we have to have other ways of reaching out there. But why do we care knowing what's central and versus what is peripheral? And we care because it does help to guide um, the staging. And that is because lung cancer guidelines do recommend invasive mediastinal st uh, staging of the mediastinal lymph nodes for central tumors. So we need to know um, what is central versus what is peripheral. Um, this is an interesting study trying to assess amongst thoracic surgeons as well as interventional pulmonologists how they define central versus peripheral. So on the right here, there's an axial cut and a coronal cut of a CT. The A lines are actually um, defined from the sagittal views of a CT, dividing the hemithorax into thirds. And the B lines are distance from the hilum, so the central hilar um, structures, dividing the hemithorax into thirds. Of note, this B line definition, so spreading out from the hilum of defining what is central versus what is peripheral, was entirely made up for the study. And there was no agreement on what the definition was. So interventional pulmonologists, as well as thoracic surgeons, they said the same things that um, half agreed that um, one definition was central and half agreed that another definition was central. So we, we do need to come to a, a, set, um, a shared definition at some point. So what if you want to do, uh, you find a nodule and you want to say, 
whether or not it is malignant or not in a little bit of a more non-invasive way rather than biopsy. And this is where proteomics comes in. This is not yet ready for prime time, but it is certainly something that is under investigation. So the pan optic study was a recent study published in CHEST, and they were looking at a proteomic classifier, which I'll go through, and they were also combining it with a, a physician pretest probability of lung cancer. And what they wanted to do was to identify whether um, nodules that were found to be pretest probability of cancer being less than 50% would or would not end up being malignant by looking at this um, uh, classifier. So it's a prospective multi-center observational study looking at small nodules ranging from eight to 30 millimeters, and they enrolled almost uh, 700 patients. And they measured the presence of two blood plasma proteins, LG3BP and C163A. And these are, uh, had previously been found to be linked to uh, lung cancer independently, as well as the inflammatory response to cancer itself. So when they combined the presence of these two blood proteins with a clinical prediction model, um, they actually found that physician assessment of the likelihood of these nodules being malignant was great. They actually outperformed both the VA model and the Mayo model that I previously talked about. So then they took this subgroup of 178 patients that had a pretest probability of the nodule being malignant of less than 50%. And when they combined the classifier with it, they only found a 16% prevalence of cancer. So this classifier performed quite well. It actually outperformed both PET scan, the lung, um, the validated risk models that we talked about, physician estimates, as well as, and it was independent of age, tobacco use, the size of the nodule, and COPD. So it's somewhat interesting to think about that perhaps in the future, um, we can use this to direct care of those nodules that we are not quite sure are malignant and have a pretest probability that's lower. So in the study, if this was used to direct care, there would have been 40% fewer procedures performed on benign nodules, but they would have missed 3% of malignant nodules. So when you look at the receiver operating curves for this classifier, which was incorporating the blood plasma, plasma proteins I mentioned, as well as the pretest probability, um, it actually, this is in the red line here, it outperforms everything we previously talked about. So clinical utility studies will need to be forthcoming, but I think it may give a little bit of a, a leeway in nodules that you think you're pretty sure are benign and may not need to proceed to biopsy as quickly. But the rest of the time, we're going to talk about invasive biopsy. So there are multiple ways that we can biopsy lung nodules. Um, of course, the uh, gold standard is the um, percutaneous transthoracic needle biopsy, the TTNB. Um, and there is a body of literature that shows that this can be quite um, successful. So the sensitivity of the biopsy itself depends upon the size of the nodule, um, the size of the needle, how often you're gonna um, pass through it, so the number of needle passes, as well as the presence of an on-site cytopathologist to confirm that you're in the right location. So for nodules that are left less than 15 millimeters, um, the chance of obtaining a diagnosis is 70 to 80%, and greater than 15 millimeters is about 90% chance. And over time, from the uh, 90s into the 2000s, um, the biopsy is actually the ability to obtain a successful biopsy has been um, improving over time. There are no randomized controlled trials comparing um, TTNB to other modalities, but we do know that it is successful at the risk of side effects. Um, there's a risk of pneumothorax and a risk of hemorrhage associated with it. In the literature, the pneumothorax incidence is as high as 15%, although um, other outlier studies will quote as high as 25%. The amount that would need a chest tube for a pneumothorax is lower, about 6 to 7%. And the risk factors for pneumothorax from a, a transthoracic needle biopsy are what you would expect. Um, COPD, older age, smaller lesion size, if it's really deep in the lung, if you're going across fissures of the lung, if there's emphysema, as well as the amount of needle passes you take. Bleeding associated with it is quite low, um, about 1%. And a retrospective study looking at both um, transthoracic needle biopsy on aspirin and Plavix actually says don't do it. That's an um, independent risk for uh, hemorrhage. But when you do discontinue um, the antiplatelet medications alone, the risk uh, does decrease. 
So what about bronchoscopy? So traditional bronchoscopy for lung nodules has actually been quite poor. And by traditional bronchoscopy, I mean um, fluoroscopic guidance with a bronchoscope that does not go past that central uh, lesion of the, uh, the central area of the lung. So for small nodules, um, bronchoscopy with fluoroscopic guidance is actually quite poor. If they're less than two centimeters, the sensitivity is only 34%. It does increase if they are larger. And the ACQUIRE registry did um, uh, agree with this. So the ACQUIRE registry is a American College of Chest Physicians registry. And they were looking at the traditional bronchoscopic biopsy um, in peripheral lesions at 15 centers. And they found that it would be diagnostic about 50% of the time. Um, and certain um, uh, tools that we are able to use will increase the likelihood of getting a uh, biopsy. So there are other modalities that we can combine with traditional bronchoscopy. And that uh, first one is radial endobronchial ultrasound. So this is a probe um, seen here that is inserted through the working channel of a bronchoscope. It gives you a 360 degree image and it is able to penetrate down five centimeters of lung. So that you can see these are the images on the right that we would obtain. The image A is what normal lung would look like with the radial probe EBUS being in the center B is an eccentric image of a nodule. So with this haziness here is all of the, um, the lung nodule itself. And then the dark area around the right is normal lung. And what we'd wanna see really is a concentric view. So over on the right here, we see the probe in the center. We see the nodule all around us, as well as parenchymal abnormalities around that. And I will show you how that will increase our yield. But we do use this frequently in our bronchoscopy suite here. And this is the view you would get. This is an eccentric view. So we see that our nodule is here. This is the consolidative area that's abnormal. And this is normal lung around it. So we know this is an eccentric view. And we know where we would then be aiming for a biopsy. Radial EBUS has been shown to be uh, more diagnostic when there is a bronchus sign associated with it. So this is what we mean by a bronchus sign. This is a CAT scan image where we can clearly see a nodule and we clearly see an airway going directly into it. So we know when we target that airway, we will land directly in the lesion and we'll have a, a higher likelihood of having a positive diagnosis here. So radial EBUS has been studied in the literature um, it's been studied extensively, retrospectively, as well as prospectively. And a recent study looking at using a thin bronchoscope, four millimeters in size, that allows us to get out to the periphery even better, in combination um, with the radial EBIS, actually increased the yield. However, in, um, sorry, in comparison to a standard bronchoscopy with fluoroscopy. And you can see that the, the bottom here, that the yield was uh, much better with radial EBIS about 50% of the time when you had a concentric view, you'd get a diagnosis. And a traditional bronchoscope and fluoroscopy was only about a third of the time. So there is an improvement um, in yield when you use radial EBIS. And another uh, systematic review showed that this was even better when the lesions were greater than two centimeters. There was a bronchus sign and there was a concentric view. So what can we do to combine radial EBIS, fluoroscopy, standard bronchoscopy, and another modality? And we actually came, um, there is electromagnetic navigation. So this was first used um, in um, other fields, neurosurgery, urology, ENT, um, and it transitioned to pulmonary in um, the mid 2000s. And basically you're generating an electromagnetic field around the patient. You combine it with a 3D reconstruction CT and a tracking sensor. And what it looks like is that this is the platform here. There's an extended working channel that goes into the bronchoscope that has a locatable guide on the end of it. And you're looking at reconstructed CT images in three planes, axial, coronal, and sagittal, as you navigate down the airways, trying to line up where that uh, uh, nodule is in plane so that we are then able to biopsy there. We can then confirm we're in the right location with fluoroscopy as well as radial EBIS. And we can use this modality both for biopsy as well as for fiducial insertion and dye marking if somebody is gonna to go to surgery in the future. The outcomes of electromagnetic navigation can sometimes be all over the place. However, um, in several studies, the yield is usually about um, 70%. So on the ACCP guidelines rate the sensitivity of electromagnetic navigation about 70%, which is held up in a um, meta-analysis as well. However, um, this is a little bit thought provoking in that there was a larger retrospective study looking at a large volume of patients that went, um, underwent EM navigation procedures 
Um, and what they found was actually the diagnostic yield was quite poor when you use EM alone. Um, when you combine it with radial EBUS, it was approaching about 50%. Again, retrospective and limits, you know, the limitations of bias of uh, retrospective studies. However, um, if you do have a larger lesion, you had a prior smoking history, you use EBUS with it, and you combine it with fluoroscopy, you're much more likely to have a higher diagnostic yield from it. There's only been one prospective study looking at electromagnetic navigation. This recently came out. This is the Navigate study. It was a prospective multi-center study, um, close to 1,200 patients, 29 centers, academic and community. They would cap the enrollment so that there was a um, similar distribution of heterogeneity and to limit bias between centers. The mean uh, lesion size was two millimeters, um, with the majority being in the upper lobe. And they found that successful navigation and ability to get tissue occurred in about 95, sorry, 94% of the uh, time, with a diagnostic yield of 70%, which kind of fits to what our previous data shows of um, the sensitivity of um, navigation. So we're still looking for other modalities to kind of boost our yield a little bit, and we do have them coming down the pipeline. Um, the first is combining a um, cone beam CT. So this is a fancy um, CT that's done in the bronchoscopy suite at the time of the procedure. And you are doing um, a cross-sectional multiplanar CT that you're then superimposing on your 2D fluoroscopy so that you're obtaining volumetric data and you're able to maneuver your tools to where that nodule is in real time. And you do want to combine this uh, usually with radial EBIS for further confirmation. There have been a couple of small retrospective studies and the data from them are quite promising. So um, this is something that may be combined with different modalities in the future, EM navigation as well as other ones. But the last couple of minutes I do want to spend on robotic bronchoscopy. So owing to the limitations of traditional bronchoscopic biopsy, radial EBIS, EM navigation, um, the community was concerned that our diagnostic yields could possibly get a little bit better and into robotics. So robotics were first introduced um, into the surgical fields in the 90s, and then the early 2000s, the da Vinci system, which is widely used across different fields. Um, and the goal is to overcome the diagnostic limitations, like I mentioned, of the previous modalities. There are currently two um, robotic bronchoscopes on the market. I've um, put pictures of them here over. Um, so you can see one um, on the left here uses a shape sensing technology so that you are consistently getting feedback as you navigate down the airways and it allows the catheter to maintain a, um, a position in the airway where it will not move, which was some of the issues with electromagnetic navigation in the past. Um, the one on the right here does still use the um, um, electromagnetic navigation um, uh, principle behind it. Um, you have a sheath and a very thin bronchoscope that is able to navigate out to the periphery and you control it with a console in your hands here. The one on the left is the console here and it's a trackball system. Both of them will have visualization. They allow you to navigate out as far as you wish. Um, and then you can wedge the catheter up against the airway wall and pierce through the airway wall. So there have been feasibility studies looking at these systems. They are um, used in humans as well as in cadaver feasibility studies that we'll talk about here. So the first is a um, human feasib uh, feasibility study that took place in um, Australia, and they had 30 patients with small nodules. They had a bronchocyte nearly 60% of the time, and the vast majority were in the upper lobe as well. But that eccentric appearance of the radial EBUS that I mentioned and your diagnostic yield with it is a little bit lower. That was present about 50% of the time, yet they were able to reach their target 96% of the time without any complications. So when they then took the same system into a um, prospective randomized controlled cadaver study, they wanted to compare the system to electromagnetic navigation as well as to the ultra thin radial EBUS. And they found that it did outperform both the um, robot itself. They were able to successfully navigate to the target. They were able to puncture the target as well. And they found that um, the 80% of the time they were able to get um, more than adjacent to the target, but when they um, uh, changed their criteria of success to being adjacent to the target, that increased as well. So it does outperform the other modalities that we do know about. 
Um, similarly, the other one of the other platforms has a cadaver study as well with a 97% overall diagnostic yield. And of course, um, there was uh, no difference in the um, lesion size, radial EBIS view, or distance from the pleura, meaning that um, getting out to the periphery is, is quite successful. There's only one of the platforms that has a um, outcome study that's been done so far, and that's because there's a one year difference between when they came to market. So one of the systems does have an outcome study of their initial 165 patients, and their diagnostic yield was about 70 to 77%, with the bronchus sign, the airway leading directly to the lesion, and the radial EBIS view being more uh, determinant of a diagnostic yield. So you can see that we can navigate out, you know, 9, 10, 11 generations of airways here. Um, but if we don't get a view on the EBIS on the right that is showing the nodule, then we have other ways that we can get this view. So the catheter that came out here at 12 o'clock is now aimed a little bit more to the 1, 2 o'clock position and rotate it. And you can see that you are able to improve your EBIS view and then increase your likelihood of a diagnostic yield. So this is all unique to robotics. And we have had the um, fortunate um, ability to use them here at Georgetown. We did our first patient on July the 31st. Um, this is our team here that performed the first case. You can see Dr. Anderson um, using the robot. We'll take you guys through the um, procedure itself. So this is in the model, um, but this image on the right here, um, I'll walk you through. This is our 3D airway tree. On the bottom right here is the CT reconstruction on the, um, sorry, bottom left. Bottom right is the airway itself, and this is the controller. So you'll notice as I play the video, we are navigating down the airway, paying attention to the reconstructed CT view, as well as the airway view at the top. And this is the robotic arm that is placed into the patient with a small catheter with an attached vision probe and you are navigating out to the airways and your target. You're staying on path here. This is the subway view you're using and you can find the target here and with confidence then insert your radial EBUS to confirm that you are in the right location. Um, I think for the sake of time, I'm going to skip the future, but I will return to our case. So our woman with her um, eight millimeter nodule underwent robotic bronchoscopy and she was diagnosed with a stage 1A1, the earliest stage possible lung adenocarcinoma. Based off of her PFT, she was a candidate for resection, but she chose to undergo radiotherapy, stereotactic body radiation out of her um, own preference. And these are fiducial markers that were inserted to um, mark out where that nodule is. Um, and aim, um, provide a tracking during radiation um, for a successful targeting of that lesion. Um, I do have a little bit more data on SBRT, but I think for the sake of time, I may um, cut this short. What I will say is that for, I'll show you this one uh, last slide here, that for our first 100 patients that were treated at Georgetown with stereotactic body radiation for early stage lung cancer, that the local control rates you can see on the right were greater than 90%. So these were medically inoperable or a small minority being those that didn't want to undergo surgery, which still remains the gold standard um, for resection of early, for treatment, I should say, of early stage lung cancers. But those that underwent um, radiotherapy had an excellent um, local control rate that spanned actually up to 12 years out. So with that being said, I'll conclude, um, and hopefully I showed that uh, lung nodule detection will increase as lung cancer screening changes and proliferates, that knowing the management options for both incidentally detected lung nodules as well as screening detected lung nodules is essential, um, that diagnostic capabilities of bronchoscopic biopsy will vary for diagnosis of those peripheral lung nodules and um, can be poor despite an increasing complexity of support systems but robotic bronchoscopy does uh, have a promising, is a promising addition to the armamentarium for both diagnosis and possible future therapeutics, which are coming down the pipeline at some point in the future.